Former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin is jumping back into the political arena. Palin, who rose to prominence in 2008 as the late Senator John McCain's vice presidential candidate, announced last Friday she will run to fill the late Congressman Don Young's seat in the last frontier state. Joining a field of over 50 candidates in Alaska's special election, Palin vowed to, quote, fight the radical left. She already has the biggest supporter of all. Former President Donald Trump, who endorsed her on Sunday, issuing a statement saying, quote, I am proud to give her my complete and total endorsement and encourage all Republicans to unite behind this wonderful person and her campaign to put America first. Joining, <laughs> joining us to discuss are our panelists, Democratic strategist Colin Rojero and Inez Stepman, a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. Thank you to you both. It's good to be here. Morning. And so, first of all, have either of you ever seen the interview that Sarah Palin did with Donald Trump back in 2016? She was at, what, OAN, I think? She was like, was that right? She was a host of, if people haven't seen it, they've got to go back and watch. Trump's eyes are bugged out. He's like, Trump is like, what is this person saying? I can't, he, can't, he like cannot follow the word salad coming out of her mouth. And you're like, Trump, Trump is the king of word salad. And he couldn't, couldn't keep up there. Uh, so Inez, what's your, what's your sense of, uh, does, her, does her name recognition and Trump's endorsement make her the front runner here? Or uh, not so much, this could be a closer race than we think. Well, I think in a traditional primary, definitely. Um, the, Alaska's primary is weird. It's uh, ranked choice voting. Um, it's a top four system, regardless of party. And as you mentioned, there are 51 candidates. So that makes it a little bit difficult to to really predict. I do think that she has a good shot in, in sort of the modern GOP. I mean, in many ways, she, she presaged a lot of the trends um, of the Trump GOP, right? So one huge, in one huge way, um, she has that image of the, the grizzly bear mama um, at a time where parents are probably the most important constituency for the GOP. Um, and, and also she made a name for herself, let's not forget, she made a name for herself before she was vice president, um, nominee um, for vice president for John McCain. Um, she made a name for herself fighting the establishment within Alaska. Um, and there was all the famous bridge to nowhere stuff. Um, she, she definitely was always sort of an outsider candidate, even um, in her early success as governor of Alaska. Um, and, and that was necessarily not necessarily like a, a sort of um, hard right position. She wasn't necessarily hard right anti-establishment before she came to, to um, sort of national prominence. So I think there's a lot of ingredients that actually she can pull on her record. And then, of course, she was an early a, a endorser of Trump, and now he's returning the favor. But uh, Colin, you know, she did resign, right, as governor. She didn't complete her term. She, she resigned. Uh, does, does that kind of thing, you know, are, are the people of Alaska going to remember that and maybe punish her for that? Uh, perhaps not. Perhaps. I mean, this is a, you know, a primary and Trump's endorsement and her star power will kind of get the job done. But uh, she, she is in the, the strange or novel position of having like sworn off public office, like having left it. Um, so how does yeah. that how does that affect this race? Uh, I think it depends on how much other primary candidates remind people and where they see her as an actual threat. If you consider name ID going in, she certainly has a, a distinct advantage. But name ID and previous history may not always equal additional uh, benefits and or votes in this particular case. I, I you know, the, the idea of a Sarah Palin candidacy again to me seems a whole lot like uh, another Fast and the Furious movie. Do we really need to see this again? It's kind mm -hmm. of the same story over and over again. That is uh, a little bit of a train wreck. So um, I, I, I I'm not confident that she will win. I think she has a little bit of a, a distinct advantage. We'll have to see how much uh, as, as we get going forward here. And, uh, and she did swear off public office. So, it, you know, it, you start public office and you quit uh, because the job is too hard. I, I'm not sure you deserve a second chance. And, and Nez, there's sort of like two camps uh, in the Republican Party at this point. There's kind of the Murkowski camp that is, you know, kind of the old old school, still still trying to like work with Democrats to to get some things done in in Congress. And then there's the other camp, whose entire agenda is basically just like owning the left and as uh, owning the owning the libs and as or as Sarah Palin put it, fighting the radical left. So. Which, which one of those do you think is dominant now in Alaska, and how does the ranked choice voting work out? In other words, you know, do, do you think that P Palin is going to have a ceiling 
that she'll have a hard time getting passed because of ranked choice voting? Or do you think that actually a lot of people in the Murkowski camp, if they can't get a Murkowski type, then at least they'll, they'd rather have somebody who will own the libs? It's, it's really difficult to say because of the specifics of the Alaska primary, but let's not forget, you know, Murkowski lost a primary in the Tea Party era. She won her seat again only by a write-in campaign and on and name recognition. So this is this is like not uh, the typical structure of a primary, which is why I'm having, uh, you know, difficulty at all making that call, because otherwise I would say, I mean, I don't agree with your characterization of it as only owning the libs, um, but, but absolutely I think a more, um, you know, sort of a Trumpy uh, stance, particularly on cultural issues, uh, is really the heart of the GOP. And what's interesting is, is that cultural stance actually has a lot more crossover appeal um, than, for example, the, the GOP's economic positions, right? I think what you're actually seeing is the culture war is the Big Ten and that a lot of these cultural issues around education, um, around, um, for example, what's happening in Florida with, with the, um, the education bill there, those are actually issues who, that bring moderates um, onto the side of the Republican Party. So kind of in reverse of what GOP consultants were saying in Washington, D.C. for the last 10 years, which is, you know, lead with the lower taxes stuff um, and, and put the social issues to one side. What we're seeing is actually the social issues and the cultural issues are coming to the fore. And I think Palin could be that kind of candidate. And in most primaries, I would say actually that puts her in a very good position. But because of the uh, particularities of the Republican uh, primary or, or the election here in Alaska, um, I, I do think there are some elements like this ranked choice voting. Voting does favor somebody who can pull in, um, you know, sort of more cross party votes. So it's it's, it's complicated um, to, to make a prediction. But I think generally the GOP is much more in that camp uh, than it is in the Murkowski camp. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think it's interesting to, to observe how Palin really exited the first time from the from from politics at a, you know, a moment of like the low watermark for the GOP's fortunes. I believe she left in 2009. Um, you know, there's a, the, the, the kind of Obama takeover happening, the you know, very, very uh, bad times for, for the GOP. And then shortly thereafter, you have the Tea Party. And, and now we're, you know, we're 10 years later, where I, I agree with you, be, in, in part by, by going hard on uh, sort of culture war issues or whatever you want to call them, Republicans now look, you know, prepared to have this massive, massive blowout uh, victory. So, so you know, Colin, as a as a Democratic strategist, you know, what what advice are are you giving to Democrats to to uh, is it about uh, you know how, how talking about these issues in a different way or, or trying to shift? the focus back to to other issues where the GOP isn't, you know, just totally racking up points on the scoreboard. We have the critical race theory, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, what is your approach? Yeah, I, look, I, I think Democrats over the past couple of years, uh, leading from the White House, have done a poor job of talking about the accomplishments that they've actually had and how they've impacted people's lives. There's not been a, a very focused, very easy to understand messaging construct around that. Why is the infrastructure bill important? How has the American Rescue Plan actually saved businesses previously and, and, and in present day? And, and, you know, things like the insulin bill, they need to talk about things, Democrats need to talk about things that actually practically affect people's lives. And, you know, look, I agree with Inez that, you know, Republicans over the past 10 years had to step away from social issues because it wasn't good territory for them. So they made some up. So they made up critical race theory being taught in schools, which it's not. It's a joke. And they decided they wanted to then, you know, attack the LGBTQ community once again. I, that's not going to last very long. And I, I disagree that oh, moderate that's all voters, the parents who are actually being moderate at voters their, actually their, want the children assignments being that are coming back. From right, you guys can't you guys cancel each other out if you talk at the same time. And it's not it's not going to it's not going to work. And I would say especially attacks on women's health care. It's not going to work. That stuff is eventually going to burn itself out and it'll burn itself out quick. But I don't think that we're in any kind of watershed movement that we haven't seen before, right? Like the Tea Party was a reaction to the Obama election, right? And like we have this, again, potential reaction to the fact that a Democrat was elected president. It's not unprecedented. So I don't think that it's anything we haven't seen before. Democrats just have to make a consistent argument about how they are helping people and doing more than just passing tax cuts for wealthy folks. And as you want to respond to any of that, critical race theory uh, made up in the in the classroom. <laughs> I sure, think I know your uh, views on this, which are yeah, mine as right. well. But I mean, go ahead. This is 
this is a silly talking point, honestly, from Democrats and from the left. Um, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with parents who are looking at their children's assignments. After a year and a half for a lot of parents of virtual school, this is the first time not only are they angry at school districts for not reopening schools in many states, um, for months and months after things like, for example, casinos were reopened. Um, but even aside from that, uh, you're looking at parents who have been looking at what their kids have actually been learning. They've been given a window into what social studies class actually looks like now um, and whatever you want to call it. And we can have a debate and I'm happy to have a debate about whether or not it's critical race theory and what the intellectual roots of this are. It almost doesn't matter to parents. They're looking at concrete examples. They're looking at affinity groups um, in their their kids schools um, that divide kids up by race and teach different curriculum to different races of kids. Um, they don't care what you call it. They want that gone from school. And with regard to the Florida bill, um, it's not an attack on the LGBTQ community. It's literally just preventing teachers from talking about sex and gender identity um, to, from kindergarten to third grade. And you know what? I think if the GOP stands on those issues, because they are absolutely happening and there's a real anger that is being um, coming up from parents when they go to these school board meetings and they're expressing that um, in, in not only in the school board meetings, but in elections. It, look, it, it won us an election um, in, in Virginia. Virginia, and it won us an election in a place where there are a lot of crossover votes. Again, this isn't a concern exclusive to the right. There are a lot of moderate and even democratic parents who are looking at this material in the schools and they are not okay with it. Um, so, you know, you can continue to pretend as far as I'm concerned, Democrats can continue to pretend this isn't happening uh, for as long as they want, because I think the longer they pretend it isn't happening, uh, the, the better it is for the Republican Party. Yeah, I, I, I think we're happy to actually tell the truth, which is it's not happening. And parents weren't upset hey, about I curriculum being taught in schools. The time. This is they, really they weren't upset about race being taught in schools because it's always been a part, and, and I would argue not enough, a part of American history as it's taught in its reality. What you have in the, in the case of the Florida bill is people not being able to ident identify that genders actually exist or that sexual preference may actually exist. What about third graders who exist or second graders who have two moms, who have two dads. So they're just left out of the conversation now. And so you're creating a society in which you are calling people others from the beginning. If you cannot actually discuss something that is a real part of society, you're just really creating an ignorant society. And that's a dangerous thing for everyone. Nobody says that we have to highlight sexual identification, but teachers should certainly be able to address it if it is brought up. Yeah, it's I mean, look, I have issues uh, for sure with the Florida bill. I've, I've talked about them on the show, but that said, I, I have seen critical race theory being taught in the class. It literally says critical race theory on the slides of the things they're being taught. So I have to disagree on that one. Uh, Inez and Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll have more rising right after this.